The Ascar 71F, a $600 quadruple telescope, just got even better with the introduction of the 0.75x reducer from Sharpstar Optics. The native focal length of the Ascar 71F is 490mm, and with an aperture of 71mm, that makes it an f6.9. With the introduction of the reducer, the effective focal length becomes 368mm, mathematically as 367.5, but we're rounding up a little bit, making it an f5.2 telescope, making it, again, 1.76 times faster, which also means that you'll be able to collect the same amount of data in 57% of the time, where we're just flipping the formula please feel free to check my math. When talking to people for the last few months about the Ascar 71F, many people have said that F6.9 is pretty slow. Now I'm not going to argue with that because it is pretty slow, but for all of you who have thought that F6.9 is slow, is F5.2 fast enough for you? And of course, along with being faster, we also get a wider field of view. Looking quickly at this image of the Heart Nebula, we go from this to this, increasing the area covered by about 76%. Both of those images are uncropped and were taken with the same camera, the TubeTech ATR2600C, which is a crop sensor camera. Before I continue, I wanna send a huge thanks to Sharpstar Optics for sending this to me to review. So I had a couple of weeks to play with this and take some images. They also gave me the option to purchase it, so of course I bought it. This retails for $189, and for less than $200, you essentially double the amount of telescopes you have. So if you have the Oscar 71F, at f6.9, 490 millimeter focal length. You just add on this, and this essentially becomes two telescopes in one that you can put in one case and travel. It's not quite the same as their modular telescope, but that's also much more expensive. With the reducer, the reducer being $189, the total cost of this is less than $800, which is a little bit insane considering how expensive quadruplets by themselves can be, more so when you add a reducer to the mix. And of course the 71F is a quadruplet telescope, which means that you get perfect colors along with a flat field. And being a quadruplet, it also means that as long as you achieve focus, you can expect your stars to be pinpoint at the very edges. And you didn't have to worry about any kind of backspacing. But with the addition of the reducer, we kind of lose the focus anywhere part, but now we have to worry about backspacing. But luckily, it's just 55 millimeters, which is the standard in most setups anyway. Uh, for example, with my tube tag, it came with these two spacers here, a 21 millimeter and a 16.5 millimeter. And along with the native spacing within the camera itself, I get 55 millimeters very easily. And most Astrocams will be something similar. And the back focus should be pretty easy to achieve with most Astrocams and even most DSLRs and mirrorless cameras with the proper spacers. So in my last video, I tested the Ascar 71F with my 533MC Pro, which has a tiny one inch sensor camera. And many of you rightly pointed out that that doesn't really stress the, or really test the flat field of the telescope all the way through. But luckily since then, as you may have seen from my previous videos that I was testing a TubeTech 2600C, which is a crop sensor camera. And once I paired that camera with the Ascar 71F, I can confirm that the stars stay pinpoint and the field stays flat all the way through at least to a crop sensor camera. Now, I haven't had a chance to use this with a full frame camera. Maybe one day I will, but the way this is built, the way Ascar has been doing their testing, Charter Optics has been doing their testing, they claim that it is flat field for full frame cameras as well. I believe it and Hopefully one day I'll get to test it and share my results with you. So of course that brings up a new question. Since the 0.75x reducer increases the field of view, does the field still stay flat with a crop sensor camera? And after some testing, here are some aberration inspections from ASTAP of some of the images that I've taken with the Ascar 71F with the reducer. And we can see that the stars are completely flat or the field is completely flat and the stars are pinpoint all the way to the corners and edges. And that's still with the crop sensor camera. And the field of view will be wider with the full frame camera and the expectation is that it will still stay flat and the stars will still stay, stay pinpoint. But again, hopefully if I ever get my hands on a full frame camera, I'll be sure to test. And if your company sells a full frame camera and you need someone to test it, call me. I've already unboxed this, but let's do a quick 10 second unboxing to see what came in the box. So the box is pretty simple. It's just a small cube box. Um, we have a sheet of instructions here. It's both in English and Chinese. We have some styrofoam for padding and inside the Ziploc bag, we have the actual reducer itself. 
We can take off the caps on both sides and we can see the glass optics in the middle here. And it looks pretty nice. Can't even tell on the video that there's glass here. This feels really good and it has some weight to it. And the whole thing is made out of aluminum. I believe there's some stainless steel parts in this too, but the whole thing, the entire housing is, it's a really nice sound. So both of these caps are also made of aluminum. And looking at the optics here, this is a triplet design, so there are three glass elements inside of this thing. So when we put this into the Astro 71F, does that make it a septuplet telescope? I just want to pause for a second and correct something I said in my previous Astro 71F review video. So I said that both of these locking knobs are plastic. I was wrong. And one of you pointed out that these are actually made of aluminum, and I did verify that they are aluminum. The a paint job here makes it feel a little bit like plastic, but no, it's pretty solid. Yep, it's totally metal and Sharp Star Optics also confirmed that this thing is metal. So there's no real plastic in this thing. There's a little bit of plastic here in the, in the locking, uh, the padding here, but that's very little. So that makes this whole thing even more impressive. It's just all aluminum, stainless steel, and glass. And it's the same for the reducer. And installing this is fairly easy. And they do include a guide here with instructions on how to do it. It's just four easy steps, but let's go over them really quickly. So if you have the visual back here, um, already take it off, so I already took this off. Since I don't use this much for visual, uh, I usually just keep the photographic adapters on here. We have a few, few parts here. The first two parts here have the M59 threads that we're looking for. And then this one at the very end has the M48 that your camera screws into. I'm not counting the cap here and we don't really need it at the moment, but we're just going to unscrew this whole thing here. Take this all off. There we go. Took it all off. I'm going to set the telescope aside here for a second and we'll do our work here. So now we're going to separate this into two pieces and we don't need this anymore. So you can throw it away. I'm kidding. Don't throw it away. You'll still need this for if you want to use the ask card. So we're without a reducer. All right, so this goes in like this. So then after you put this in, you hold it up, you wanna make sure that you can read it when the camera adapter is at the bottom. So it has M59 threads and there are M59 threads in here, inside the, uh, uh, inside the threads here. So this actually goes inside here and you just screw it on pretty easily. There we go. So now we bring our telescope back and what you'll see is pretty cool. So this actually goes inside the telescope. And you'll see that the M59 threads here, the M64 threads here of this adapter here will actually screw into the outside, uh, into the threading of the telescope itself. So the reducer, it actually goes inside and it is no longer visible. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There we go. So this actually physically reduced the focal length of the telescope, which is pretty cool. Uh, other reducers that I have, they usually just stick out, they, they add length. So this one gotten reduced by about whatever the length is of this. And that's all you really need. All right, and then to achieve back focus, 55 millimeters starts at the end of the M48 right here. So it's from here, from here to the camera sensor. So as I showed you, you know, I have a couple of these uh, M48, uh, these spacers that came with a tube tech. So I do this, so let's try to screw this on. Great. And then if I bring my tube tech, so this has a native 12.5 millimeters of spacing uh, from here to the sensor. And if I screw this on, now I have the required 55 millimeters from here to here. Now that I have it installed, we can use this in the field. So first you wanna make sure that you update your imaging profile to your new focal length, whichever software you're using. Here I'm using Nina, so I do it in Nina itself where I copied my regular profile and it's updated the focal length and F ratio. I put 369 millimeters, but here it should be 368. Again, mathematically it's 367.5, but being off by a little bit is okay because this is mostly for plate solving and framing anyway. Next, I also open up my PhD2 for guiding. Again, I copy over my profile so that I have to redo everything. And I go into my settings and I update my focal length. So this will help PhD2 guide a little bit better as well. So I only had enough time to shoot two deep sky objects on the same night. I wish I had enough clear skies to shoot a couple of broadband objects, but these were both emission nebulae and I used the L-Extreme filter and each frame was 300 seconds long. And here I am shooting the Heart Nebula. 
Looking at the aberration inspector within Nina, we can see that the stars are pinpoint all the way to the edges, which is amazing. And the stars look great, and I'm really, really happy with the data I was able to acquire. Both the images that I'm about to show you were unfortunately shot through a pretty thick layer of smoke and moonlight. But I didn't really have a lot of choice but to shoot those nights because clear skies are a rare commodity. I had to deal with quite a bit of processing issues, especially when I was looking at the O3 layer of the images, but I think I was able to get something decent. So let's compare the Heart Nebula as seen through the Astra 71F, both with and without a reducer. You can ignore the color differences because they were processed slightly differently, but you can clearly see that we have quite a bit more of the region in our field of view with the reducer version. Both of these images are four hours of integration time, but I technically have a better signal to noise ratio with the wider field of view than the native 71F because I collected more light in the same amount of time. Please don't ask me to make a video on SNR. Just, just get more data. So here's another image comparison. This time it's the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. Again, ignore the colors. That first one I probably need to redo at some point, but I'll eventually combine the data and reprocess them both as one file. Both of these images here are two hours each, so the integration here isn't as signally noisy than the Heart Nebula. But again, my wider field of view has better signal to noise ratio because I was able to collect more light in the same period of time. I'm really glad that Sharpstar Optics made this reducer. The first time I spoke with them, they told me that they didn't have one planned, but of course that's probably what they just told me because they didn't want me babbling. And I'm really looking forward to using it on Orion, just all of Orion. So is this a necessary item for your arsenal? I would argue that this entire hobby isn't necessary, but that's what makes it a hobby, right? You do it because you want to, not because you need to. But I think adding this to your arsenal will make an amazing telescope even better and much more flexible. Plus, it's also a really cheap way to essentially double your telescope. Uh, same aperture, but different focal lengths. And I've been loving this telescope and the larger field of view is perfect for most of the nebulae that I want to capture. As you can see, it fit the elephant's, ne elephant's trunk nebula, the heart nebula, I haven't done the soul nebula in the series yet, but I think it'll fit all this perfectly, especially with a crop sensor camera. Now, I'm returning my crop sensor camera soon, so I'll have to go back to my 530 MC Pro, but even then, the extra area of field, in my field of view will definitely help. So this kind of telescope has been amazing, and I kind of want to see Sharpstar Optics make an even bigger one. And if anyone can make a large, larger telescope at a price point that's affordable and makes sense, it has to be Sharpstar Optics. And I know Ascar already has a 130mm triplet, but wouldn't it be cool to see a budget-friendly Ascar 130F?